Well, hello, and welcome to the December 2022 ENSO seminar. We are very lucky today to be joined uh, by uh, Jana van Grunsven from the Technological University at Delft. Um, Professor Grunsven's work is in uh, the ethics and philosophy of technology, and we'll be uh, discussing um, a paper today and, and some of the, the developments that have come from it that uh, were involved in or in, included in a, a recent special issue on uh, ethics and the inactive approach to cognitive science in the, the journal Topoi. Um, so Yana did uh, her doctoral studies in the, the New School for Social Research in New York and has done some postdoctoral work in Fordham University and uh, took up your position in Delft in, in 2017, is that right? That's right. Excellent. So, um, and this is I, I, this is a kind of the, the opening and um, the, the the talk that you'll be talking about today and the, and the paper that it's developed from is kind of part of an opening salvo of something bigger, which uh, you're going to mention later on. So I'm looking forward to to hearing about that and to sort of see how the work is going to be blossoming and developing in the near future, which is it's kind of exciting actually. It's um, with with all of the the tech. Um, sort of kerfuffle and hullabaloo that's going on at the moment between the, the mess that is social media and the horror show that is um, open uh, artificial intelligence tools and so on, the, the, the sort of the amount of work that's been developing and, and sort of exploding in this whole domain has been fascinating to watch. Yeah, great. And I think an activism can uh, play a, a very active role in, in, in thinking about our embeddedness in a technological environment. So really excited to be able to talk about that here. Excellent. Um, well, listen, thank you very much um, for joining us this morning. And I guess without further ado, we can um, we can we, we can begin. Yes. So I invite you to, to share your screen and, um, and uh, talk to us about an activism, the technological environment and the paradox of moral perception. Great. OK, uh, let me see. Hold on. I got to slideshow. Okay. Can you see um, yep. my slides? Good. That's it. Okay. That's all good. Great. So uh, thank you so much, Marek, for inviting me um, to share some of my uh, previously conducted uh, research on sort of the relationship between an activism and, and ethics, and um, also some of the new research that this has um, started to set up for me and um, really looking for some input and, and see what, what, what experts in this area of embodied cognition are, are thinking about the direction of my thoughts. So very grateful for the opportunity. Um, so the title of my talk is An Activism, uh, the Technological Environment and the Paradox of Moral Perception. And the title kind of blends together. Hold on now. I have to figure out how I get to the next slide. Okay. Um, it blends together, as I mentioned, uh, a title from a previous paper that was recently published in the Topoi Special Issue on an activism and ethics, um, and a new uh, large research project that I was really fortunate to get funding for, uh, which I've entitled Mattering Minds, Understanding the Ethical Lives of Technologically Embedded Beings with 4E Cognition. And this is a a three-year research project funded by uh, the Dutch Research Council that it's really just started. So um, yeah, lots of uh, open to lots of ideas and input. So um, I'll, I'll focus primarily on this notion of um, a paradox uh, of moral perception and what an activism has to do with it. Um, and here and there, I will interject my talk with references to how this is shaping um, my new research project. So uh, then I'll start with the obvious. Uh, what is this paradox of moral perception that I'm talking about? Um, I'm not talking about um, a logical paradox, but a phenomenological paradox. Um, it strikes me as something noteworthy. That on the one hand, but I gotta move my uh, my little picture thing for a second. So on the one hand, um, 
we seem to have so much trouble with. Okay. Um, new laptop, new, new house, everything is uh, unfamiliar. Anyways, so on the one hand, I think, or I argue that in everyday life, um, perceiving people as what I call moral subjects, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, is very easy. We do it all the time, successfully, every day, pre-reflectively, with near automaticity. But on the other hand, I think also... <laughs> on a daily basis, we might fail at perceiving people as moral subjects. Um, it's something that can be quite difficult, that requires a certain amount of effort and reflexivity. Um, and so in some sense, the very same uh, perceptual object, if you will, a human being, is something that's effortly avail effortlessly available to us as warranting a kind of moral concern. And on the other hand, can be visually unavailable to us as issuing those kinds of moral demands. So uh, I'll specify a little bit more now what I mean by moral perception or moral visibility and what it means to be perceived as a moral subject. And since this is an inactive um, seminar, I'm not going to really um, defend or explain the inactive concepts that I'm using. I'm just hoping you'll see that an activism is really informing my way of painting the picture here. Um, so I'll start with, with this idea of, of the, the effortlessness within the paradox that I just discussed. So I claim that when things go effortlessly as they should, people are visible as precarious sense makers, by which I then mean that they are visible as beings whose embodied comportment in the world reflects their meaningful, psychologically rich, lived perspective onto it, right? So I directly, so this is very adjacent to direct perceptual theories of social cognition that I directly perceive your, your smile as expressive of your happiness or of your reluctance or, right, we have all these direct perceptual ways of, of seeing subtle differences in psychological meaning ex expressed in people's bodies um, and their embodied comportment. So this to me is part of what it means to see someone as a moral subject, as, as a possessor of a psychologically rich, meaningful lived perspective onto the world. Um, it also entails, and this is, I think, very much part of the inactive story about how action and perception um, are uh, close coupled and mutually enriching and reinforcing. Um, it also entails that we perceive people as affordances in a way, specifically as affording and depending on responsiveness and communicative engagement. And I think you see this a lot in the work of uh, developmental psychologist Vasudevi Reddy, but also de Jager, uh, all over this idea that within our interactions with other people, we get a true sense of who they are as enveloping entities, right? That the other is not a static entity, but we can have a sense that somebody is more or less visible to us depending on the nature of the interaction itself. Um, and then, thirdly, uh, the idea is that to perceive someone as the possessor of a meaningful, psychologically rich life um, also entails uh, that we see them in a way as, as owners of their experiences, as authorities who, who possess a kind of first-person ownership of their expressed lived experiences that we do not have direct access to, right? So there is a kind of asymmetry. This is something that Dan Sahavi, I think, puts a lot of emphasis on in his work on empathy. There is a kind of asymmetry in our experience of other people where on the one hand, their bodies are <laughs> providing us with a kind of direct access to their lived experiences, and yet their experiences are always theirs. They're not mine, right? So that that 
that I think very quickly gets us to a sense of other people having authority or ownership over their experiences. So I take it, and I'm not really going to defend this claim. This is a, a phenomenological claim that uh, um, uh, I think many of us can recognize when we look at uh, many, though certainly not all, but many of our daily interactions with our significant others, people on the street. Um, I take it that this is part and parcel of what it means to perceive another as a minded being. Um, and so for me, this has moral significance, and that's why I am reframing this as perceiving others as moral subjects, right? They have rich lives, they're worthy of engagement, they have a kind of authority over their own experiences, and this is, this is part of our effortless day-to-day -day interactions with others. What I'm interested in in my new project um, in the Topoi paper, I don't mention the notion of human flourishing or well-being, but I'm interested in unpacking more what this notion of a kind of effortless moral visibility and moral perception, what, how, how we can present that as part and parcel of what it means to flourish as a human being and how an activism provides resources for, for fleshing that out. Um, so in a moment, I'll talk about the attention that this notion of effortless moral perception has received in ethical theory. I take David Hume to be a paradigmatic representative of this view, um, but it's, it's not given a whole lot of attention. And I think in part it is because of its effortless nature, right? There's a kind of analogy here in a way uh, with the notion of trust as something that we depend on in our day-to-day -day functioning and in our ethical lives, but we don't really become aware of it until it really breaks down in minor or major ways. But the fact that it does break down and also the fact that it does break down more for some people than for others um, makes it, uh, to me, a very morally significant phenomenon to focus on. And what I discuss in the Topoi paper is that one um, group of people for whom this effortless moral perception has really broken down in detrimental ways is for um, many, though certainly not all, but many persons on the autism spectrum, especially those on the autism spectrum who are non-speaking. So I discuss a bit the case of, of Mel Baggs, who you see here in this image in their um, video in my language, language, which I highly recommend um, you watch on YouTube if you are not yet familiar with this video. And they invite us into their specific way of interacting and engaging with the world, a very tactile, embodied way of, 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 of sense-making, if you will. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, maybe I'm going off on, on a tangent here. I was told myself to keep this concise, but when I'm talking about this case, it's, it's always hard for me to, but um, one of the things that I experienced when watching this video is um, initially a kind of a sense of awkwardness or intrusion. I shouldn't be watching them behave in this way because it's it's so odd it's so out of the ordinary what are they doing how is this meaningful how is this sense making and then at some point in the video that 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 sense of of awkwardness turned back on me because i realized that i had a very limited way of seeing the meaning in mel bags's bodily comportment uh using quote unquote neurotypical language um, through augmentative and alternative communication technology, uh, Mel Bag shares with us that they may have an atypical way of communicating with their environment, but it's nonetheless meaningful for themselves. And it contains all these nuances that neurotypical people and viewers might be fully unaware of. Now, a label that has been given to the kinds of movements that you're seeing in this image here is stimming. Stimming or self-stimulatory behavior has for a long time been dismissed as purely pathological, sort of as 
the autism running its way through the body of the autistic person without having any kind of nuance or significance not reflective of a psychologically rich perspective onto the world. But thanks in part to autism activism um, and, and, and research that's taking the notion of neurodiversity very seriously, it's becoming, uh, people are taking more serious that stimming can take on a rich array of meanings, that it's not pathological, um, but that, and that it can also express very fine grained expressions of emotions. Um, but this is a new development, a new movement. And at least up until quite recently, I would argue that the kind of effortless um, moral perception that I sketched a moment ago and the, the elements that that contains has been withheld in many ways from uh, particularly non-speaking autistic people. So, right, um, all too often non-autistic uh, non autistic people uh, are not visible as precarious sense makers whose embodied comportment in the world reflects their meaningful, psychologically rich lived perspective on it as people who afford and depend on responsiveness and communicative engagement and as authorities um, of their expressed lived experiences. Um, and as such, they have been excluded from a shared social space in which they are recognized as people who matter and are worthy of engagement. So I, I hope that this kind of brings out the ethical stakes of understanding this, what I call this paradox of moral perception, um, the, the importance for our well being or our flourishing of, of enjoying this kind of moral visibility to others, but also the fact that it isn't as easily extended to everyone and, and the kind of damage that that can do. Now, let me quickly situate this paradox in the landscape of ethical theory. The way that I've done it in the Topoi paper is to bring out that the kind of the effortlessness of moral perception and moral visibility, you really see that, I think, in, in Hume, especially part two of the treaties, where he really turns to the notion of sympathy. I'll, I'll talk about this in, in a moment a bit more. Um, and somebody who's done a, a lot of work to bring out precisely the difficulty of perception and the idea that really perceiving people aright can take moral effort and can um, uh, contain moments of moral failure is, is, I believe, Iris Murdoch. Now, they both emphasize one aspect of the paradox, um, but I think inactivism has the resources to capture both. And why I think that that is important is because by really understanding it through inactive resources, we can also identify two areas in which moral misperception can potentially be mitigated or targeted. And I think these areas, um, which are um, areas concerned with embodied embodiment norms and the material environment, are often overlooked in ethical theory, where we are prone in many ways to focus on deliberation and choices made by rational agents and, and less so on embodied agents situated in a rich material environment. Okay, so um, very briefly, I'll bring out some analogies between an activism and Hume and his, his effortlessness of moral perception on the one hand, um, and Iris Murdoch, who emphasizes the, the difficulty of moral perception. And I'll take a little bit of a detour um, in the middle via uh, epistemic injustice. And I'll explain why I think it's helpful to bring that literature in as well. So first, um, 4E and Hume. So here is a, a, a paragraph from Hume's treatise that I think really brings out the kind of effortlessness that I've been hinting at all along. So Hume writes, the minds of all, well, yeah, men, of course, 
um, are similar in their feelings and operations, nor can anyone be actuated by any affection of which all others are not in some degree susceptible. As in strings equally wound up, the motion of one communicates itself to correspondent movements in every human creature. When I see the effects of passion in the voice and gesture of any person, my mind immediately immediately passes from these effects to their causes and forms such a lively idea of the passion as is presently converted into the passion itself. In like manner, when I perceive the causes of any emotion, my mind is conveyed to the effects and is actuated with a like emotion. Of course, old, old language, but, <laughs> but the idea still holds uh, and 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 I think even though Hume doesn't really work with an explicit account of embodiment, you really see here how he's trying to get at how gesture and voice and and the expressive body of the other directly affects me and how how it implicates me and how it warrants a kind of responsiveness. Um, and and Hume uh, really identified this ability, which many inactivists would probably call social cognition, but he calls it sympathy. He sees this as um, the foundation of ethical life. If we wouldn't be implicated in each other's minded lives in this way, ethics wouldn't get off the ground. Um, I think there's um, a lot of, yeah, like-mindedness here between Hume and, for instance, a passage from Sean Gallagher, where you get, I think, a very similar idea. So he, he argues here that we do not try to get into the other person's mind. We try to get into their world, or more precisely, into a world that we already share with them. Ordinarily, in our everyday encounters, in the pragmatic and social contexts that characterize our lives, we gain a perceptual grasp of another's contextualized actions, gestures, and expressions, and we understand their speech acts as meaningful and intentional without looking beyond such meanings to their mental states. So very similar in the kind of image, I think, that these passages um, evoke, right? We, we are always already invested in and sharing a world with the other embodied human beings is basically the idea. Um, so one, one important difference, I would say, is while they both centralize the phenomenology or the phenomenology of direct um, social perception is um, similar, they have different ways of explaining what makes this direct perceptual social cognition possible. So Hume, with his empiricist resources, he really... Um, understands this as enabled by automatic subpersonal mechanisms of association over which we have little to no control. So it's sympathy, essentially, for Hume. It will run its course no matter what, whether we want to or not. Um, and I think inactivism has a more nuanced um, way of explaining this. Um, you saw it already a little bit in the Gallagher quote, which really focuses on shared contexts. Um, but the way I see it is that direct perceptual social cognition for inactivists is essentially mediated, right? The phenomenology is that it is direct. But what makes it possible is that we possess certain skills, that we participate in certain bodily interaction norms, that we inhabit a certain shared environment and practices and cope with shared artifacts, and that it's these things and our familiarity with those things and pr practices and skills that makes it so easy and effortless to directly see the intentions, emotions, meanings, sense-making activities expressed in another person's body. Right? So if you, um, anyway, this is already to hint at the idea that these are also areas where uh, effortless social cognition, or as I put it, moral perception, can 
break down, be disrupted, but may see, maybe also augmented or promoted in cases where this is needed. Okay, so um, Hume uh, underscores the effortlessness in a way many inactivists do as well, um, but I also want to talk about moments where um, moral perception can fail. And when I was writing the Topoi paper, I wanted to come up with a way of being able to differentiate between moments of moral failure and just moments of miscommunication and misperception that are innocuous and that we correct for right away or that stem maybe from, I don't know, being tired or just not yeah sick or, right? There are so many ways in which we can momentarily misperceive someone else's rich experiential life and their ownership of it um, that maybe do not really warrant a label moral misperception. And I found that the epistemic injustice literature um, gave me some resources to demarcate, okay, here's where we really want to talk about moral misperception and not just fleeting innocuous miscommunication or mismatches between two or more embodied minds. Um, so when is perceptual failure moral failure? Um, so a very brief uh, overview of a field that I'm by no means an expert in. So it, it could be that this is where I'll get some comments about why is this applicable and how and aren't you missing this or that version of epistemic injustice. Uh, I would love to hear it. Um, but yeah, why I think the epistemic injustice field can, can be sort of a, a friend here to an activism and enriching the ethical uh, dimensions of an inactive outlook on, on human social cognition is that it really is a field that has helped identify all the ways in which people can be rendered invisible as communicative, interactive, sense-making beings. Um, the emphasis is often, though, on linguistic expression and communication. Um, uh, and in doing so, one of the claims that, for instance, Christy Dodson has made is that as speakers, we are vulnerably dependent on hearers. Um, so speaking is about more than just conveying communication. It's also about being heard as a speaker with authority, right? Someone who has authority over their experiences and the, the experiences that they're trying to communicate. So she writes, a speaker's dependence on an audience identifies a need that any speaker possesses to be heard. And I want to say something similar at the level of perception that there is a need as sense-making beings um, to be seen. Um, the denial of this need, Dodson argues, can amount to a form of epistemic violence in communicative interaction. And she argues that this occurs when the following conditions um, are met. Um, she says epistemic violence is a refusal, can be intentional, can be unintentional, of an audience to communicatively reciprocate a linguistic exchange owing to what she calls pernicious ignorance. Pernicious ignorance should be understood to refer to any reliable ignorance, so not a fleeting momentary one where I'm misunderstanding or there's a mismatch or I'm, you know, I'm sick or tired and it's making me just not perceive, you know, that my four-year-old isn't just whining, but really, really, really needs some serious responsiveness right now. Uh, right, it's got to form follow from a reli reliable ignorance that, in a given context, harms another person or set of persons. And reliable ignorance, she furthermore defines, is ignorance that is consistent or follows from a predictable epistemic gap in cognitive resources. Now, Trip Glazer has taken this account and has said 
This doesn't just apply to linguistic communication, it also applies to non-linguistic bodily expressed emotions. These are things that convey, in his words, communication or sense or meaning, and this can be misperceived following from a pernicious predictable gap in cognitive resources. And the ones that he discusses are, for instance, from emotion stereotyping, where a false generalization creates expectations about which emotions a person will or will not express in a given context, and these expectations can skew the observer's perception. Um, it can follow from emotion apathy, where an observer could invest due care in the reading of someone's emotions, but for lack of trying does not. Or from emotion parochialism, where an observer is ignorant of a community-specific style of emotional expression, such as stimming, which I discussed earlier, and so fails to read an expression correctly. Closing the gap in cognitive resources can loop back into perception, thus mitigating instances of moral misperception and epistemic violence. That's the idea. So uh, to revisit the, the case that I spoke about earlier, um, these three different forms or sources of moral misperception that Trip Glazer introduces, or he calls it emotional misperception, um, they concern what I call particular moral misperception. So in those instances, one person is perniciously misperceiving the meaning or in his words, the information of a particular expressed emotion by another person due to some form of reliable ignorance in a manner that causes harm, right? So due to some stereotypical idea about how, this is his example, how women are supposed to um, behave in job interviews a woman who is standing there with confidence might be, uh, the confidence in that instance might be mistaken for arrogance um, and harm ensues as a result. So um, it's not that in this instance, the woman is altogether misperceived as a sense-making being, but the particular information that her bodily comportment was conveying is misperceived due to a reliable, pernicious um, cognitive gap in uh, epistemic resources. Um, and and the, the case of stimming um, can uh, stimming can lead to similar instances of particular moral misperception. So, for instance. I cited some of the research that has really shown the richness and the fineness of fine grainedness. I never know how to say that. Um, uh, that particular forms of stimming can take on, and it is argued in that paper that it's in the bibliography that I included in the presentation um, that this fineness of grain is visually available. So anyone living with, for instance. Uh, a person who expresses themselves through stimming should build up the the, the knowledge or the know-how or the expertise to be able to distinguish between stimming out of excitement or out of fear, for instance. And so someone who doesn't invest due care, right, to be able to make those distinctions might be accused of um, uh, misperception due to a kind of uh, emotional apathy that uh, Trip Glazer identifies here. So we, we can talk about all these instances of what I call particular moral misperception, where a particular form of bodily expression um, is reliably misperceived in a way that harms the, uh, the person who wants to be heard, who wants to be perceived. Okay, uh, so now Iris Murdoch, because I think Iris Murdoch, uh, blended with some inactivism helps bring out another type of moral misperception that I think should be on our radar as well. And that's already kind of been implicit in my discussion of, of how uh, non-speaking autistic persons have been misperceived. 
Um, and that is a form of misperception that I call categorical misperception, not just particular misperception. Um, first, a little bit about Murdoch. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with her work, she is really a figure who has railed against the emphasis on choice and action in ethics, arguing that perceiving people is, in her words, morals too. And she thinks that moral agency is not just about making, uh, how do you call it, intervallic decisions, um, but that it's, it also entails um, an endless task, as she puts it, of attempting to see particular objects and people clearly. Um, now, one of the reasons why perceiving people right is an endless task for Murdoch is it's an ontological reason. She thinks that there is a kind of fundamental opacity to people um, and that there, there's, there is something elusive. Um, she also refers to it as the texture of a person's being, right? Who a person is, is much more than the sum of all the statements and propositions that they can come up with, but it, it, it also lies in how they behave in a particular situation and context and, and how they express themselves. And well, anyways, I, um, that's the idea. Um, and I, I really see something similar, both in the work of Merleau-Ponty, but also in, in some inactive work on social cognition, um, where there is this idea that we continually constitute one another as relational beings through our encounters with one another. And my sense making is not something that happens in isolation, uh, but what I can say and do um, in a specific relational context is, is, is in part enabled by the way in which you respond to me. So who I am and who you are within our interaction isn't predetermined, but it's something that requires constant effort. It's an endless task of unfolding who we can be in relationship to one another. And what I see of you is also determined by how I act and respond to you. Um, this sets up, I think, another form of moral misperception that isn't just about um, misperceiving a particular expressed emotion or desire, um, but is really about misperceiving someone robustly as a sense-making being at all stemming from reliable ignorance to keep borrowing from the epistemic injustice um, literature. Um, and I think here again, so the case of non-speaking autism is paradigmatic. Um, it's not just that particular instances of stimming have been reliably misperceived or miscategorized, um, but it is all too often been the case that autistic people have been viewed as sense makers at all, right? So here's a, a quote from Walter Spitzer, an epidemiologist who has frequently testified in the U.S. Congress about autism, um, where he really defended, um, I'm not sure if he still holds by this view, but he has publicly defended and proclaimed the view that autistic people are dead souls live in a living body, right? So that the body moves, but there's not much mindedness behind it. Um, so this, I would say, is a paradigmatic instance of categorical moral misperception. Um, and the fact that it is... Um, um, so it's a reliable type of mis categorical misperception, right? It stems from a reliable cognitive gap, um, a gap in cognitive resources. Um, and I explain this in much more detail in the paper because it follows from a certain theoretical commitment to what autism is and how we should best understand it. So once committed to that theoretical commitment, the reliability of that cognitive um, outlook will, of course, repeat itself. Um, and it is obviously pernicious because it's silencing uh, 
autistic people who are not being heard and seen as the sense-making beings that they are. So uh, I explained this, I think, much better um, in, in the paper, but uh, yeah, got to keep it a bit, bit abbreviated here. Um, okay, so we now have this picture of the effortless of moral perception, and it's important for our sense of self as beings who matter. Um, the, the ways in which moral perception can fail, both in particular and categorical ways. Um, and I've already hinted at how an activism can uh, explain both. Um, and I think in doing so, it helps us identify areas where moral misperception can be mitigated. So here is um, an uh, image of Colin Portnoff. He is he's no longer alive, but he had uh, ALS. And at this point, when he's, he's giving his talk, it's also referenced in the bibliography, he was speaking through a speech-generating laptop. Um, and uh, what he really beautifully captures in his lecture, uh, which he gave to augmentative and alternative communication technology engineers who are tasked with the job of designing technology that enables people like Colin to remain expressive and to convey uh, their sense-making in shareable ways. Um, what, what he really strikingly conveys is uh, in my opinion, two things that really belong in an inactive frame of mind. Uh, first, he points out that by having to communicate through this technological artifact, there are lots of aspects, embodied aspects of communication that he can no longer participate in. So any kind of nuance in his voice, right? He talks about how he wants to sound sexy or ironic or snarky, and none of those things are available to him anymore. None of that has to do with the content that he's conveying or in a sideways way, perhaps, right? But it is about embodied sense-making, I would say, and all the nuances that it entails and the inaccessibility of that nuance to him as a sense-maker. Um, he also talks about the impossibility of keeping up with the timing and the, the, the implicit rhythmic rules of interpersonal communication, right? So especially talking in groups, he will type ahead to try and keep up with the conversation, but he falls behind and he feels himself slowly receding into the background. Um, but, 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 even one-on-one, -on -one, the temporality of the interaction and the timing of it changes. And it has implications for the degree to which he is seen as a meaningful and authoritative speaker. Um, even though I had been working on uh, an activism for a while before I, I watched his speech, it, it, it really brought out to me how a lot of the um, embodied dimensions of human interaction um, are quite normative, right? That we, 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 if you are lucky enough that you are able to fully participate in the rhythmic temporality of turn taking, um, and if you uh, are able to directly express right, your sense-making activities through your embodiment, you're visible, right? But if, if that's less available to you, your moral visibility is very quickly at stake. Um, and I think an activism can, can help us articulate this, right? So that's uh, one of my, my claims, that the effortlessness of moral perception is deeply important, it's also dependent on implicit, often I would say neurotypical and ableist interaction norms that shape who is more or less visible as interaction worthy sense maker. Um, secondly, what this case from Colin Portnoff also brings out is that 
and this is the case, I mean, right now in this Zoom meeting as well, I suppose, right? Increasingly, a lot of the ways in which we express ourselves and communicate ourselves, uh, but but even more generally, our, our ways of, of moving about in the world, it's, it's, it's not an empty space. It's a space completely saturated by different technological artifacts and systems that set up particular affordances, interaction affordances, um, but also that work with particular assumptions about how embodied minds can and ought to move and interact. Um, so it, I hint at this in this paper, but my bigger new research project is really about teasing that, this out in, in much more detail. Um, and in doing so, um, I think an activism provides the foundation because it really situates uh, human minds as interactive bodies in a material, social material context. But I also think it needs a little bit of help. Um, so I'm bringing an activism in dialogue with insights from post-phenomenology, um, as well as crypt techno science. I'm just going to drop those labels <laughs> uh, because I know I'm running out of time already. Um, um, but anyone who's interested in, uh, yeah, chatting with me about that and the link that I see between these, these different schools of thought, I would love to hear from you. Um, and what I hope ultimately by bringing these different theoretical perspectives in dialogue, what I hope to uh, develop is really a theory or an outlook on how uh, technology shapes our moral visibility and with that our ability to participate in meaningful interactions of participatory sense making and how that in turn um, affects our, our well being or our ability to flourish as embodied technologically situated beings. Shall I stop sharing? Thank sure. you. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you very much. What a rant. Sorry. <laughs> No, it's wonderful. It's, it's so great. weird to just you just yeah. All you can do is just keep talking instead of the, the screen is a very strange audience indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but thank you very much. The the, the this was very rich, and there is a lot there. We have a few people watching live, so I'll keep an eye on the chat on the the live stream for comments. There, a um, little bit of horror at. Um, the, the description of uh, is it Walter Spitzer's view? Yeah, um, okay. understandable. It's um, the, there's there's kind of a number of things that I'd like to um, get get into, and I, I think there's there's some really interesting links with other work that's being done at the moment, actually. Um, but the I guess if I might start with some sort of just sort of smaller technical points. Um, before we get into the bigger conceptual stuff, yeah. because you introduced the idea of um, almost like there were kind of two levels of misperception. Some of them are are moral, and some of them aren't. Um, or so I'm I'm curious as to how sharp you 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 see that distinction between the moral yeah. and the the not moral misperception. So I don't the, have a sharp. Yes, thank you for asking that question. I don't. I don't have a sharp distinction, and I think in everyday life, it, it is sometimes harder to tease them apart than when we can sit back and make conceptual distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that it goes a, a bridge too far to label any kind of misperception of another person in their precarious sense making as a moral failure or something that requires immediate mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, but I, I, I think it, it, it requires contextual analysis to figure out um, whether a particular instance in which someone feels misperceived or where we worry we might have misperceived someone um, is something that warrants kind of our moral attention. Mm. Uh, and I think uh, here too, the epistemic injustice field 
could be helpful, at least in reminding us that one of the key things in engaging in such contextual analysis is to look at at power relationships between inter, interperson in dyadic interpersonal settings, mm-hmm. um, uh, differences in the uh, the various levels of development people are in as sense makers, right? Um, mm-hmm. What I can, uh, the yeah, can, can I can I accuse my four-year-old of morally misperceiving me when (laughs) they don't see that I'm really tired. I think you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, But no, I don't, I don't think hard lines are helpful, but I think some conceptual distinctions can, like I said, it, it can help us bring out more clearly ways in which we can mitigate more structural forms of moral misperception right yeah. yeah i mean it is it's an interesting because it's it, it's um it is one of those kind of recurring themes in the morality literature is those people who like to have a sharp dividing line yeah. and say yeah. that's not yeah. a moral question this is a moral question and so yeah. on and yeah. the inactive approach generally has this tendency to turn dichotomies into gradients um, yeah. But when you know the, the the term moral gradient terrifies people as well, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's sort of yeah. feeling our way through yeah. that that sort of that, that yeah. sort of marsh of categories is a yeah. sort of a of something to be done a little bit carefully. And yeah. so it, I, I guess it links a little bit to one other point, um, and this is again just a small point and just a um, perhaps an opportunity to unpack uh, Iris Murdoch's work a little bit. Um, in that there was just, and it, it might purely just be to do with the, the, the issue around quotations and context, is there was the discussion, uh, so Murdoch's phrase is the opacity of the person. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess that's a little bit different. The opacity suggests that there's something there, but we can't see through it, or there's something there that we just can't see. Whereas there's a, a sl- somewhat different sense of the texture of being from the inactive view, which is simply that, well, there might be something there, but it's just so dynamic that it, you know you will never have an exhaustive description of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not necessarily an opacity as such as just a kind of a radical partiality or incompleteness. Yeah. Um, and do you think there's any mismatch between those views, uh, or is it is it just a, a matter of the the particular language that's getting getting used in a yeah, I think it's I, I would I would say that it's more of a a language thing. Um also because she does um believe that this opacity should be a kind of motivational trigger for looking better, right? So there mm-hmm. is it 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 um it's not a fundamental opacity. Um but it's just her way, I think, of calling attention to the richness of what it means to be a person and to have a life uh, and to be seen as someone who's having a life. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I, I, I don't know. I, I would, I, I, re- I see that as similar to the inactive idea that perception is, in a way, always perspectival. And especially with um, social perception, uh, mm. the, the perceptual object that you're seeing is something that you're simultaneously interacting with and that's responding to you perceiving and interacting with them. And so at any given moment in the perceptual interaction, there's something out of sight, right? Yeah. There is, um, yeah. So I, I I I'm more I'm more interested in the similarity there I guess yeah. than in the difference but maybe you can convince me otherwise. <laughs> I I have no interest in doing so. No, it, it makes perfect sense. I'm just curious as to yeah. Yeah. Um, how radical I guess or, or how complete um, whether Murdoch has any sense of this true self you know, just obscured uh, sort of true other person that you're missing rather than there's just, there will always be more to see if you look closer. And yeah. I guess it, it seems to be in that second, you know, it's, it's both yeah. challenge and invitation. Yeah. Um, that's that's keep, how I, that's how I read her. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. 
So yeah. the, um, I have a long comment here from Michael Peters online. Um, I, it may be two comments, so the, okay. it's in a number of sections. So at some point, I'll stop. Yeah. And I might then restart, depending on on whether um, I haven't had a chance to read it through yet. So great talk, uh, Yana. So thank you. Um, about the relation to post-phenomenology um, or the, the post-phenomenology and activist relationship. Um, I think post-phenomenology and more specifically the relations that it identifies, alterity and so on, uh, can inform an active cognition approaches for how to focus on different types of um, relations. So, for example, in alterity relation, different kinds of cognitive interactions are possible in terms of affordances and constraints. Um, and uh, Anko's done some work on that. So about epi epistemic injustice, I think it's very ex a very exciting uh, connection. All right. So that's this is that's a first comment. So okay. um, the yeah. the sort of happy to discuss further. So I expect that might be a, a sort of a potentially a, a, an offline conversation. Yeah, great. But I guess is there um, are th this idea of different kinds of cognitive interactions being um, made possible, and is there you know the that notion of affordances and constraints? Is there something specific in the the post phenomenology in activism relationship mm -hmm. that you see as as needing teasing out there or? Yeah. Is there any other specifically fruitful um, set of concepts that you think are going to be relevant? Oh, so that's the that's the first question. Still, you're. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you're turning it into a question. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, I have, hopefully to... I have articulated <laughs> or expressed it well. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I, I'm, um, I'm still working on a hunch here because I think they're, they're really. Um, conceptual, well, always such a weird word, but I think the word is bedfellows. I, I mean, they're, they, they are both very indebted to the phenomenological tradition, mm. um, very interested in different ways in the notion of environmental affordances, but of course, post-phenomenology um, has really just put a lot of work into showing how particular technological artifacts um, can set up different intentional relationships to the world and, and how not just particular artifacts, but also uh, particular uh, ways in which those artifacts are used, right? Open up different relationships to the world. So the mm -hmm. same VR headset can... Um, uh, how do you say it? It, it can be incorporated as a, an embodiment relationship while using it. And at the same time, it could set up an, a hermeneutic relationship to the world because it allows you to see or interpret the world in a new way. Um, and I think these fine grained distinctions um, are, are less so there in an active uh, looks at um, uh, material affordances, mm. technological material affordances. But I think what um, what might be underplayed a little bit in post phenomenology is um, is the social. Uh, so the, the the look is 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 very often at the the I technological artifact world um, relationship, mm -hmm. um, and so this very dynamic interactive. Uh, notion of sense making and also to me the the existential aspect of that the idea that the world matters to us right and that these technologies that surround us can make the world more accessible to some than to others and that this affects their standing as sense making beings I, I think that that is something that an activism can bring in more and that you don't get as much of, but this is, you know, pretty, a pretty loose, suggestive uh, remark, but that, that's where I'm headed. <laughs> it's a, it looks like a rich vein to mine. Right? Um, so Anker, second point, I think is again, just a, 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 a more comment than question, but an expression of enthusiasm for right. the, the relationship, the connection with epistemic injustice in particular. Um, so there certainly seems to be strong um, opportunities for um, how the insights that that gives perspective can be cognitively grounded in an activism uh, and possibly also then lead towards um, suggestions for how we could intervene and educate people on epistemic inju um, injustice. So um, it's the, the, it looks like there's a, 
um, a rich work. And I, I guess the, there's there's already other work undergo. I mean, I, some of the other papers in that same top boy special issue uh, would seem to have found the same work. You know, that there was a lot of um, recurring themes there that looks like there'll yeah. be, there'll yeah. be yeah. lots yeah. to work from. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I, uh, uh, I, I think that there's, we can also probably expect more work to, to highlight this, um, yeah, the, the body as, as an area and, and, and bodily communication as an area where epistemic injustices occur. Whereas in the past, the emphasis had been on, on linguistic communication mm. and exchanges, but mm. I, yeah. There's, I mean, there was a f fascinating aspect of embodiment that um, you you raised, particularly when I think you started discussing the the Colin Portnoff case, and and that um, one of the interesting things that seemed to sort of come out of that was the um, part of what bodies do is allow us to act in a sort of a holistic way, whereas technologies partial out certain kinds of actions. And separate them then, you know, in some ways decontextualizing them, allow the, allowing them to articulate and yeah. be recombined in new ways, perhaps. Yeah. But also then, of course, once you've separated them, they you you lose the the issue around cadence and tone of voice, for example, in yeah. in the, the example of the, of the yeah. ALS the speech synthesizer. Yeah. Um is a yeah. it it tells us something really important about embodiment. I think you're absolutely right on that. Yeah. It's yeah, um, there's going to be a lot to unpack there. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Uh, uh, one of my PhD students right now is working on brain computer interfaces used by uh, ALS patients, mm. and he is he is really homing in on on this aspect as well. That uh, yeah, if you work with a more functionalist view on what communication is. The technologies that you end up designing and that you think will contribute to a person's sense of well-being as an expressive, yeah, as an expressive self will look very differently than if, for instance, you adopt a more inactive view, embodied view on what communication involves and what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And so these different theoretical frameworks of the the mind um, are literally materialized into the technologies that are supposed to help people flourish. Um, so I think there are, yeah, there are um, real life um, contributions that an inactive theory can make in the area of technology development that we should really do more work in yeah <laughs> okay that was excellent well this, we we've taken up a, a great deal of your time and i'm very grateful um i'm very grateful for your time this morning and also last week yeah, technical yeah. difficulties so i you have been very generous with your time and with your work and i'm really looking forward to seeing more from the project i think it looks to be just in a, a fascinating and really rich and Thank you. yeah and, really fruitful area of research so i hope uh, yeah, i hope great great to get the keep the conversation going yeah yeah, yeah. thank you so much um, thank you very much and we will yeah. we'll uh, we'll finish the seminar here and hopefully see everyone again in the spring for another ANSO seminar sounds great all right bye <laughs> good break thanks